Well, um, you know, I am a founder of an organization called Oma Project. It's a, it's a non-profit organization, and we're working with the Somali youth and their families. Mo one of our goals is to build a recreation center, um, you know, we just really need it because we have a large population, especially young generation. We have um, a lot of women who are wearing the hijab, like me, or covered up, who are not able to participate in normal um, um, public gyms and or recreation uh, centers. So to have a gender-specific recreation center, that was our number one goal. Um, and and, and um, the other two part is we're trying to, uh, we're working with the city of Minneapolis in, in uh, creating a project called Somali Youth Future Leaders. And, and it's to train 10 Somali youth to become the state um, leaders, state council slash. Um, and, and what we do is we provide the material, we provide the resources they need, and we give them the platform to, to uh, work from. Um, and, and, and show them what, what leadership means and who's who in the city and how they can participate and how they can get involved and also how they can actually create their own um, leadership projects where they actually lead some of the programs that we're doing. And the other part is the creation and that's the one we received a youth prize grant is to create um, a mediation, um, um, not, no, a mediation uh, training. So we just finished that. We had we trained three, 13 Somali youth to become state mediators and receive um, a license through the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court, which they actually have right now. They are, it, was, it was amazing. Had uh, both boys and girls to um, be a mediator and, and be builders within the community. I believe that, especially with, with people of color and where we have been, and you know, having this all discriminatory and racism within the American system and all um, the, you know the different um, organizations and groups, systematic racism and all of this have to be disturbed because it's created this this um, it has been created to disable um, people that look like you and me to um, not participate in the system and understand how the system works. And so um, a lot of a lot of the so like right now what's happening, the Black Lives Matter, I believe that's creating a lot of communication. I believe it's creating a lot of media attention, and I believe a lot of people are looking into ways that they can better their relationship with with the um, people of color. Um, and and I believe though I don't um, I'm I'm not agreeing on the way they're doing. Um, I believe that to at least talk about it and to show that, hey, you know what, we're not we're not different. We're we're all American. We can do uh, better. We're all citizens. We're lawyers. We're doctors. We're all of this. Um, is is one of the things that we can do as as a as a, as a society to to disturb um, is to speak against all kinds of racism and all kinds of um, violence and and injustice. Um, but if we don't talk about it, then we don't, we, we, it feels like we're embracing it. But if we're not at the table, then you know what? You're either at the table or you're in the menu. And that's most of the time what's happening. Um, so I believe that some of the things that we can disturb is to be at the table, um, is to be as loud as we can, is to create our own media, um, and to create our own programs and policies that will help our communities, so like economic um, disparities, how we can do it is to actually create our own ways of hiring our, our community, but at the same time, we, we cannot say, hey, you know, all white are bad, or all, it's the system. But that system has to be different, because now America is different. You have me, who's from all the way from East Africa, then you have Africans and other African American, you have Hmong, you have Middle Eastern, you have a lot of people. That system has to work for the community, not against it. So my name is Rashad Anthony Turner, uh, currently uh, doing a lot of speaking engagements, doing some consulting around education, uh, but still 10 toes down in social justice around police brutality and trying to make some changes on that front. The, the one thing that you know, I think people have to take notice to is when Malcolm X took his pilgrimage to Mecca, right? he learned some things. And the most important thing that he learned is this isn't a black-white problem. Right? So we as black people, people that are white, 
this isn't our problem. This is a U.S. problem. And, you know, you hear a lot of people will say, oh, well, all lives matter. Then you hear the other side, black lives matter. You know, w within that, right, if, if we can't mesh those things and both of those things can't be true, if black lives can't matter, all lives can't matter, blue lives, if all of those lives don't matter, I would suggest those people look internally to see how much you love yourself. Engaging. I, I think it's important, um, in my opinion, because a lot of people can sort of distance themselves from the issues. Uh, if they're not affected by the issues, if they're not affected by uh, being racially profiled by the police or being assaulted by the police or being killed by the police, it's easy to sort of keep those things at a distance and not pay them the necessary attention to create that change. So I think when we disrupt things, disrupt the flow of a day, uh, business as usual, as we would call it, it, it really forces people, even those people who might want to reject this idea that racism even exists, it forces those people to sort of have to think about it in that moment that they're stuck in traffic, um, think about it in that moment that they maybe can't access the state fair, or think about it in that moment where they're maybe stuck at the airport not being able to go. And I think that it's very important um, that, that we don't coddle people. I think it's 2016, um, these issues have been going on forever, um, for as long as I've been alive, for as long as most of the elders have been alive. So I think that it's important that you really have to put it in people's faces. Because the fact that we're still dealing with these things in 2016, um, without really seeing any you know, change to law, um, change to society as far as our culture, um, change in police community relations, I think it's important to just kind of put it in people's faces where they can't avoid it. And e even if it's for 30 minutes stuck in traffic, I think that the actions that we've done over the past year and a half ha have really created a lot of awareness, and have forced people to stop and think and check their own privilege. And, and I think more importantly, um, has woken up the black community um, and, and created a space, created an avenue for those who want to get involved to get involved. And I think that that's the most important thing that, whether it be a disruption of the state fair or traffic, light rail, that we get as many people involved in this as we can. Um, and for me, you know, the, the time of creating awareness, I think, is past us. Just because you're white doesn't mean that you have to take on this mindset of the oppressor. Um, but, but how we work you know, hand in hand, uh, working with allies or accomplices, whatever you want to call them, um, is important. And I think that it's important that we, we do that from a space that is really focused on the people um, and understanding that everybody has room to grow, right? I, I read a lot of books, do a lot of things around social justice, organizing, but I always understand there's something more to learn. So I think that as we work with allies, um, it's our responsibility as black people who are leading this evolution to create spaces, create avenues, create lanes for allies to participate. But participate in a way that they're, they're not entering the situation with privilege, right? So when we ask an ally to shed their privilege or use their privilege to benefit the oppressed group or marginalized group, that's what allies should expect, right? A lot of times, or sometimes, I'll say we'll see white people who come in and they think that they're going to be the savior. And I think that's where that fine line is on, you know, addressing white supremacy with them to make sure they understand what that is and what that looks like in person. But also a balance of understanding like, hey, we, we haven't been able to do this on our own. You know, through history, we've seen allies join the movement. Um, you know, we, we've seen in present day white people sort of speak up, and, and I think that that's important. So it's like, how do we embrace that, um, but, but still sort of center around black voices and black people? I think it's tough to do, um, but if we're educated on this side and we educate the other side, then we'll all know that somewhere along the line we're fighting the same oppressor, you know? So my name is Emilia Gonzalez Avalos. I am the Executive Director of Navigate Minnesota. We are a grassroots organization that works around immigration and education justice in the state. Uh, we center the realities of undocumented immigrants in the state and our families with mixed status. I think that racism 
racism thrives in isolation. And the way to keep disrupting it is also by building relationships, by really getting to know each other, not just because we are, you know, in this space and movement building and it looks, you know, cool, I guess, for some people on TV. But actually, to keep it moving, you have to build relationships. You have to know where you're standing with whom and trust people and love people. I was given these, these names and claims of identity from people that love me, from teachers that loved me, from mi jefa Susana de Leon in Aztec dance, from my sisters that I went to college with, from my friends. I was given this by people that loved me. And that itself is what racism don't want to happen. They don't want us to. It's, it sounds cheesy, but it's really about love. <laughs> And this is what I'm giving my daughter. To disrupt racism, you have to take ethnic studies class, too. To disrupt racism, you have to, to find those teachers of color doing the work in academia as well. Uh, to disrupt racism, you have to know how you are going to identify yourself, even if it's identity politics. But you have to know exactly who you are and own it, and that's OK. Uh, once you have that, you definitely you will build a, a different, a, a more grounded under, understanding of the world. You are the universe. Isn't that what uh, Degrassi Tyson says? We are the universe. <laughs> it's about why is it important to disrupt everyday racism, yep. right? And if we agree that racism is really about power, the ability to act, then why is it important for us to disrupt everyday power and power structures, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that's really a really important question because um, when people don't have power or when there are, so I think that's a really important question because I actually think everyday instances of power and powerlessness is the most corrosive type of uh, injustice because when something happens to you every day, um, number one, you, it's not as noticeable. And number two, because of the repetition of the frequency, um, and because you can't, you can't gauge the change, then the, uh, there seems to be an understanding that that is the norm. And somehow the norm is acceptable, right? So let me give you an example. Um, you know, in Dakota County, we had a white farmer who from year, that all the years that we knew, he said to Hmong farmers, I will rent land to you at, you know, even though, he, he, so every year he would say to Hmong farmers, I will rent land to you. And we know now that the land was twice, the, and we know now that the rental fee was twice what he was charging other white farmers. Um, but he would say to the Hmong farmers, um, I will rent land to you, but you have to allow my family to come on the land whenever they want to and take whatever food they want to. And if this is every year, and the farmer and his family comes every week and they take something from you, you just think, well, this is the norm, right? And you don't see that actually over the whole season or, or over the life of the many years that you've rented to this farmer, he's actually been stealing thousands of dollars from you. And you actually think that this is normal, so when you go to another farmer and they say the same thing, you think, well, I guess that's okay. Even though in your heart, you know, and even amongst your family who are maybe as young as six years old, you know something is wrong, that that's not right. But you have to almost like begin to doubt yourself. And I think that's why that everyday type of racism is so corrosive, is even more corrosive. Right? Because you question your own sense of what is right or wrong, like your own moral compass. And you begin to accept that that type of um, treatment is acceptable. So again, if we think about racism as about power or lack of power, right? I think food and agriculture is exactly the nexus of that conversation because in two ways, 
Number one, when you can grow your own food, when you have access to resources that allow you to grow your own food, when you have the knowledge to grow your own food, which is a very important knowledge, right? We value the, the skills and trainings of doctors. We don't think of the same thing as, the, we don't always apply the same value to farmers, but if we didn't have farmers, we wouldn't be able to eat, right? So anyway, so um, if you think about it in these two ways, first of all, when you have the ability to, so, so first off, when you have the knowledge and the ability and access to the resources to grow your own food, then it's, that's the fundamental. You know, if you think about the Maslow's triangle, that's the fundamental. You've got food, so everything else is gravy, right? So then you can operate. You, you are not beholden to anyone. And again, if racism is about power, when you can grow your own food, you can eat your own, you have a source that, that uh, you are so, a supply of nutrients that will give you the power that you need, you are not beholden on anyone for your livelihood, for your life, for your, your actual substance. You're not beholden to anyone for your actual substance. So when you are not beholden to anyone for your actual substance, you have a type of freedom that other people who are enslaved do not have. If I know where I'm going to get my next meal, where I, if I know that I'm going to have um, the proteins, the carbohydrates to make me wake up, to give me power, to swim, to act, to work, that I can do anything compared to someone who is a prisoner who is waiting for someone to bring the food to them to eat. Food is at, the ability, the knowledge of how to grow food, the tools to grow food, the, ability, the, the, the conditions to access food. That is the foundation of wealth creation. And not just for the individual, but for the family and for the community, right? Because when you teach a man to fish, that man will go and fish and he'll feed not only his family, but he'll feed his extended family and the community. And then from that, they'll spring up more markets and the markets then will also spur basket weavers that will help the, the fisher people now to get more food. I mean, food is the beginning of wealth creation. 